Hello everyone, my name's Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. In today's lesson, we're going to learn how to recognize the major types of organic reactions. Even though this is a general chemistry course, understanding these patterns now will make organic chemistry much more intuitive later on. Every organic reaction can be viewed as atoms being added, swapped, removed, or shifted. And when we analyze reactions in this way, the long list of mechanisms you see in organic chemistry become much easier to organize because most reactions follow a set of predictable patterns. To begin, it helps to recognize that a large number of reactions can be grouped into four general categories. The first category is addition, which describes reactions where atoms are added to both ends of a multiple bond. The key idea is that, for example, a carbon-carbon double bond contains a pi bond that's weaker than the sigma bond beneath it, and this pi bond can break during the reaction. When it breaks, the electrons that once formed the pi bond become available to create new single bonds. As a result, each carbon that was part of the double bond forms a new bond to an incoming atom, and this converts the double bond into a single bond. The example that's shown here demonstrates this clearly. The alkene reacts with hydrogen chloride, and during the reaction, one carbon bonds to the hydrogen, while the other carbon bonds to the chlorine. The double bond disappears, and the product contains two new single bonds. That pattern is characteristic of an addition reaction. It's also important to know that the same pattern applies to triple bonds as well. A carbon-carbon triple bond contains two pi bonds, and either one or both can be broken during addition. Breaking one pi bond converts an alkyne into an alkene, and breaking both converts it all the way to an alkane. And the underlying idea is the same. Atoms are added across the pi bond, increasing the number of single bonds in the product. From here, it makes sense to transition directly into the opposite process, which is called elimination. Elimination reactions reverse the behavior we just described by removing atoms from adjacent carbons in a molecule, and that will result in the formation of a carbon-carbon double bond. So when two groups are removed, the electrons that once formed the single bonds reorganize to form a pi bond between the two carbons. And that causes the single bond to become a double bond. The example provided uses sodium hydroxide as the reagent. Sodium hydroxide acts as a strong base, removing a hydrogen from one of the carbons, while another group, in this case chlorine, leaves from the adjacent carbon. Once those groups are removed, the molecule forms a carbon-carbon double bond and produces hydrogen chloride as a byproduct. This pattern is characteristic of elimination, and it is the mirror image of what we observed in addition. Now, elimination reactions can also extend beyond double bonds. If the starting molecule already contains a double bond and has appropriate atoms or groups on adjacent carbons, then an additional elimination step can remove those groups and convert that double bond into a triple bond. Next up is substitution. In a substitution reaction, one atom or group is replaced by another, but the carbon framework keeps the same number of bonds. This is an important point because unlike addition or elimination, substitution does not involve changing the degree of saturation of the molecule. We're simply exchanging one group for another at the same position on the carbon skeleton. So to visualize this, imagine a carbon that's bonded to a group we call A. When this molecule reacts with another species, which we call B, the incoming group B attaches to the carbon while A leaves. And the result is that the carbon A bond is replaced with a carbon B bond, and A becomes a separate species. This maintains the same number of total bonds to carbon, so the oxidation state of carbon does not change. And a classic example is the chlorination of benzene. 
When benzene reacts with chlorine in the presence of a catalyst, such as iron-3 chloride, the chlorine replaces a hydrogen on the ring and hydrogen chloride is produced. This is a nice illustration of substitution because the carbon atom in the ring has the same number of bonds before and after the reaction, but the identity of one of the attached atoms has changed. After substitution, the fourth major category is rearrangement. Rearrangement reactions are quite different from the others because the atoms are not being added, removed, or swapped. Instead, the connectivity within the molecule changes. Atoms or groups migrate into new positions, which means the bond network is reorganized. This is not a simple rotation or a flipping of the molecule. Bonds are being broken and new bonds are formed, and the molecule adopts a new structure that often has greater stability. The general idea is that a group originally attached to one carbon shifts to a neighboring carbon, leading to a new arrangement of substituents. And this process is driven by electronic stability, and these arrangements are extremely common in organic chemistry. A helpful example is the arrangement of a molecule where the hydroxyl group and a hydrogen migrate to give a more stable carbonyl compound. The movement of atoms within the molecule leads to a structural change where a carbon-oxygen double bond forms while a hydrogen relocates, and that shows clearly that this is not just a simple rotation, but a true reorganization of the bonding pattern. Now that we have a solid understanding of addition, elimination, substitution, and rearrangement reactions, we can start to appreciate how these same ideas scale up into processes that create materials we interact with every day. Once we recognize the patterns of atoms being added or removed, it becomes much easier to understand how small molecules combine to form things like plastics, fibers, and other large-scale structures. To make that connection, we shift from individual reactions to polymerization, which is simply the process of linking many small repeating units together to make a long chain. We begin with addition polymerization, which applies directly to what we already learned about addition reactions. In this type of polymerization, the monomers contain double bonds. Those double bonds are the source of the pi electrons that allow the chain to grow. When the pi bond breaks, each carbon forms a new single bond that connects to the next monomer. And this repeats over and over and over, making a long chain without producing any byproducts. Polystyrene, polypropylene, polyvinyl chloride, and polyethylene all form in this way. Even though their structures look different, the underlying pattern is the same. A monomer with a double bond opens up that double bond and attaches to the next unit, and it creates a continuous carbon backbone. The letter N under each of these structure indicates that that pattern repeats many times to make the polymer. The second major pathway is condensation polymerization. While addition polymerization depends on the reactivity of a double bond, condensation polymerization depends on the presence of two functional groups that can react with each other at opposite ends of a molecule. When these groups react, they form a linkage and release a small molecule, usually water. This mirrors the condensation reactions we introduced earlier, but now the reaction repeats along a growing chain. So if an alcohol reacts with a carboxylic acid, that linkage formed is going to be an ester, and the polymer produced is a polyester. If an amine reacts with a carboxylic acid, the linkage formed is an amide, and the polymer is a polyamide. The key idea is that each monomer must have two reactive ends so that the chain can continue to grow in both directions. The first ex example shown is polyester. So here, the repeating pattern comes from an alcohol reacting with a carboxylic acid, and that forms ester linkages throughout the chain. Because each monomer has two functional groups, the reaction continues and it releases water at each connection point. 
This is chemically the same as a simple esterification reaction, just repeated many times. In the second example, we see a polyamide, where an amine reacts with a carboxylic acid to form amide linkages. This type of polymerization is fundamentally the same chemistry that produces proteins in biological systems, where you'll see amino acids link together through amide bonds known as peptide bonds. And recognizing that pattern really helps students connect organic chemistry to both biological and industrial applications. At this point, the goal isn't to memorize these polymer structures, but to understand the logic behind how monomers join together. If the monomer contains double bonds, the chain forms through addition. And if the monomers contain two different reactive functional groups, the chain forms through condensation. Now that we've compared addition and condensation polymerization, let's check our understanding with a couple of quick questions. The first question asks, which of the following polymers is formed via condensation reaction? A says polyvinyl chloride, B says polystyrene, C says polyamide, and D says polyethylene. Here we want to remember what we just discussed. We said polyvinyl chloride, polystyrene, and polyethylene were all examples of addition polymers made from alkene monomers. The two condensation polymers we talked about were polyester and polyamide. So with that being said, the correct answer here is going to be C, polyamide. The second question asks, which functional group do all monomers undergoing addition polymerization have in common? A says ester, B says ketone, C says amide, D says alkene. In an addition polymerization, the monomers must contain a carbon-carbon double bond so that the pi bond can break and form new single bonds that link the chain together. That means every monomer must have an alkene functional group. So the correct answer to this question is D. Now that we have seen how synthetic polymers form, we can transition into how nature uses these exact same chemical ideas to build the large biological molecules that we rely on every day. The key idea is that biological polymers form through condensation reactions, meaning two functional groups react and they release a molecule of water as the bond forms. Now, even though the structures look more complex than the plastics we just discussed, the underlying chemistry is identical. The only difference is that nature uses specific functional groups repeatedly, and those combinations create predictable linkages. Let's begin with proteins. Proteins are long chains of amino acids, and every amino acid contains an amine group and a carboxylic acid group. And when these two functional groups react, the amine acts as a nucleophile, and the carboxylic acid provides the electrophilic carbonyl carbon. So, in short, they join together, water is released, and the new linkage that forms is an amide bond. In biology, we call this amide linkage a peptide bond. When many of these reactions occur in sequence, we form long protein chains, and each one is held together by a repeating series of amide bonds. Sugars provide our next example. And the chemistry here involves alcohol groups. A single sugar molecule contains many hydroxyl groups, many alcohol groups. And when two sugars react, one alcohol group attacks the carbon of another, creating an ether linkage. So this bond is called a glycosidic bond in biological systems. During its formation, a molecule of water is released, which again, fits the pattern of a condensation reaction. And by forming these glycosidic bonds over and over, complex carbohydrates like starch and cellulose are created. Let's now move into triglycerides, which are fats. The chemistry here again mirrors what we saw earlier with synthetic polymers. A triglyceride forms when a glycerol molecule, which contains three alcohol groups, reacts with three fatty acids, each of which contains a carboxylic acid group. 
the alcohol carboxylic acid pairing undergoes a condensation reaction to form an ester linkage. And as a result, a single triglyceride contains three ester linkages, each formed by releasing a molecule of water. The last example is nylon, which represents a biological pattern, but also connects directly to a synthetic polymer you have seen earlier. Nylon forms when a molecule containing amine groups react with another molecule containing carboxylic acid groups. Every amine acid reaction forms an amide linkage, and repeated condensation of those two monomers pr produces long nylon fibers. The chemistry is exactly the same as the peptide bond formation that we saw with proteins. The only difference is that proteins use amino acids as monomers, while nylon uses small organic compounds designed for industrial poly polymerization. And these examples show that whether we're forming a natural polymer, such as proteins, sugars, and fats, or a synthetic polymer such as nylon or polyester, the same functional groups drive the chemistry. Alcohols combine with acids to form esters. Amines combine with acids to form amides. Alcohols combine with alcohols to form ether linkages. And in every case, water is released, which is the defining feature of condensation polymerization. And by recognizing which functional groups are reacting, we can immediately predict the linkage that will form regardless of whether the polymer is part of a living system or part of a manufactured material. To wrap up this lesson, let's check our understanding with one final question that ties everything together. The question asks which of the following statements is true? A says, Ether linkages are formed from carboxylic acids and alcohols. B says ether linkages are formed from carboxylic acids and amines. C says ester linkages are formed from carboxylic acids and alcohols. And D says ester linkages are formed from two alcohols. So to solve this, we go back to the patterns we just learned. Ester linkages form when a carboxylic acid reacts with an alcohol and it releases a water in this condensation reaction. Ether linkages, on the other hand, form from two alcohols. So the only statement that matches a correct fun functional group pairing is going to be answer choice C. And with that, We've completed this lecture. I hope it helps. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.